Good evening, and glad that you could uh, join us uh, this evening. My name is Anne Johal. I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. Glad you could join the discussion this evening. It's uh, separated out into two parts. Uh, the first part, Air India, redacted at the confluences of history, memory, and our silence past uh, panel discussion. And following that, part two, my colleague Michael Boucher will be moderating a talk, and he'll give a fuller introduction uh, of our guests. Uh, uh, it's entitled 30 Years of Silence and Longing, A Journey into Music, a discussion of the artistic process related to the development of Air India redacted an artistic collaboration between Canadian and Irish artists involving Turning Point Ensemble and other partners, which will premiere at SFU on uh, November the 6th. We'll also have some uh, poetry this evening from uh, Renee uh, Saklikar, who actually did her book launch in this very room uh, almost two years uh, to the day, which is one of the only book launches that uh, violated the fire limit because people actually couldn't get in. It was so busy and, and out the door. I got a lot of emails about it the next day from people getting into trouble, but it was actually a, a very, very fantastic event, and we have the same uh, moderator this evening. I also wanted to acknowledge that we're on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, uh, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, our moderator this evening, we're really lucky to have Naveen Gurn with us, who is a community engagement specialist and curator whose work centers on intercultural dialogue, storytelling, and community engagement strategies. He applies these strategies to storytelling projects, exhibitions, workshops, and public forums. You may have seen the Pangra Mi Vancouver Spangra story 2011 at the Museum of Vancouver. He's been involved in spectacular Sangeet at the Surrey Art Gallery. And in 2014, Naveen was the project manager for the Komagata Maru 1914 to 2014 Generations, Geographies, and Echoes project that brought together eight institutions across Metro Vancouver to collaboratively commemorate the centennial anniversary of the Komagata Maru. So you join me in welcoming Naveen Gurn. Thank you so much, Am, and thank you to all of you for coming here this evening and sharing your time with us. Confluence. The word confluence is, is unique. A confluence isn't an equation. It's not one side that balances another. The word confluence is not cause and effect. It's not one thing led to another or one thing that led to multiple things. A confluence is a gathering place, a place where people come and share and share stories. And tonight's event really plays on that idea of the confluence. Because we'll be dealing with themes that are difficult, traumatic, still going on, we're engaging with them at this level of shared history. And one way to do that is through storytelling. And tonight what we want to do is look at that and look at how stories and marginalized stories and stories from the archive and stories that are silenced have a chance to be heard. It's quite arrogant sometimes to say you're giving voice to a history, but providing the space for that history to, to be shared is something quite unique, and it's a, a confluence. The people sharing their stories with us today are scholars, academics, artists, activists, people who I deeply, sincerely admire. I want to start off by introducing them to you, in case you don't know them, Ms. Milan Singh, completed her PhD in the School of Communications at Simon Fraser University. Her Shirk-funded doctoral project focuses on the Canadian government's commission of inquiry into the bombing of Air India Flight 182. Using public testimony, legal and government documents, and media reports, her research examines the complexities surrounding Canadian citizenship. Millen's research interests include the political activity of the Canadian South Asian diaspora, the Kamagata Maru incident, and media representations of marginalized groups. She is currently a research fellow at the Center of Policy Studies of, on Culture and Communities at SFU, and it's a pleasure to have her here. <laughs> Gurpreet Singh is a broadcaster who's chosen to sit at the very far end with Spice Radio in Burnaby. He freelances for the Georgia Strait and Hindustan Times and publishes a monthly magazine called Radical Desi that covers alternative politics. He has authored four books, Terrorism, Punjab's Recurring Nightmare, Fighting Hatred with Love, Voices of the Air India Victims' Families, Defenders of Secularism, 
and why Meva Singh killed William Hopkinson. He is currently working on the book tentatively titled as Canada's 9-11, Lessons from the Air India Bombings. Good week, welcome here. <laughs> For once, you're far right. Uh, Dr. Chandrama Chakravarti is an associate professor in the Department of English and Cultural Studies and co-chair of the Asian Research Working Group at McMaster University. She has published extensively on nationalism, masculinity, and cultural memory with a focus on South Asian and the South Asian diaspora. So with South Asia, sorry, and the South Asian diaspora. Publications include Masculinity, Asceticism, Hinduism, Past and Present Imaginings of India, Mapping South Asian Masculinities, Men and Political Crises, a, spe a special section on the 1985 Air India bombing in Topia, Canadian Journal on Cultural Studies, and co-edited the anthology, The Art of Public Mourning, Remembering Air India, which is forthcoming. She is currently conducting interviews with families of those who lost loved ones on Air India Flight 182, and is co-organizing an international conference on the Air India tragedy at McMaster University in May 2016. Jandir Maji, thank you so much for coming today. <laughs> Our final panelist is Skamal Arora. Gamal is a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. Her research focuses on gender violence, religious practice, and memory and trauma in the Sikh, quote, widow colony in New Delhi, and is based on two years of ethnographic fieldwork. Her work is supported by a doctoral, doctoral fellowship from UBC and Shirk. In 2014, she received the Nehru Humanitarian Award and the Dr. Lakbir K. Justil Award from UBC, as well as the Zora Neale Hurston Award from the Association of Feminist, for Feminist Anthropology. Gama holds an MA in Gender and Development from the Institute of Development Studies from the University of Sussex, and her, contrib and her, her contributor works can be found in various online publications, the Sikh Formations Journal, and the edited Indian Women Issues and Perspectives. She considers Dili her second home and has graciously come here after straining her back muscles, after preparing for a weightlifting competition, was that what it was? After helping her parents move. Thank you so much, Kamal. Uh, as I mentioned off the top, the Confluences talk we're having today is a thematic discussion of histories and, in a sense, sacred histories. And the three things we really want to focus on today include the role of the researcher in the official stories, how to memorialize and give weight to a moment um, that hasn't been experienced firsthand by the researcher themselves. At the same time, what stories have the, po the panelists found that have taken on, I wouldn't say a hegemonic condition, but have been seen as the go-to story, the way it happened? What are some other ways that they've seen history happen through their own work? And the idea of the living memory, the struggle and the opportunity of sharing a story that is still in the process of being told, either by a new group or an individual or a community as collective consciousness. Before we begin our discussion, I'd like to introduce one special component of tonight's evening, and she is Renee Sarojini Saklikar, whose work, Air, Children of Air India, is an award-winning text, and whose opera will be opening next week. I want to say a bit about Renee before we begin. Renee writes The Canada Project, a lifelong poem chronicle that includes poetry, fiction, and essays. And published work from the project appears in many journals and anthologies, and you can see on top there, Air India Redacted, her groundbreaking, important work that debuts next week as SFU Woodward's. This panel discussion is a way of introduction into that work, and there'll be a panel following this that also delves into that story. Ladies and gentlemen, please introduce, help me introduce, <laughs> Renee Sakulika. It's a privilege to have you all here on a busy Vancouver night. I just see someone very special in the uh, audience. Thank you for coming, Trish. I'm going to begin um, with a long poem that some of you will have heard that I hope will act as a counterpoint and uh, a correspondence to this uh, enriching discussion. From Children of Air India, Unauthorized Exhibits and Interjections. 
C A N A D A. In the aftertime, always, there is also the before, June 23rd, 1985. Punctured, probed, embedded, sediments, other people's stories, tales, anecdotes, gossip, family legends. A nation twists, a body of provinces, and down by the river, each story bit a laceration inside, deep down, secrets dismembered, one limb after another, incident as saga, saga as tragedy, tragedy as occurrence, so what, a plane explodes, so what, people die, they die every day. Body, blast and counterblast, Air India Flight 182, story, and the stories of other people interact, a toxin, Alloy, mixed suffering, name the Ukraine, find the Dukabors, ferret out head taxes. Also, Cambodia, Ireland, the bombing of Britain, Guernica, Dresden, Gaza, Afghanistan, Khmer, Ararat. All such entries in any such list, incomplete Auschwitz. Each name releases vibrations. Komagata Maru. Internment and confiscation, words tremble into this cornered saga, a litter suppressing action and accumulation, and we are down at a river, lumber on the docks, metals underground, salmon on the pier. Look at the dates, they buzz, such flies, 1888, 1910, 1945, 1947, 1967, 1985, also add 1907, 1911, 1914, 1962, 1997, and after scandal, song, rise up, Air India, a portal, the river, a conduit, each comer story, a stain on a shack, lean-to, split-level house, hall, lodge, grocery mart, train station, bridge, railroad, condo tower, sky train tracks, emanating messages hoarded in hoax nation, a taking and a taking this country receiver of peoples and always underneath the everlasting story. This is how we suffered, list each band, tribe, linguistic group, hereditary chief, no accounting with those names, not released because not student enough, not seeker enough, not listener enough. Each tale incoming, woven, unending saga, citizens, settlers, First Nations, neighbors, families, loners, saints, thieves, liars, and fine, upstanding sons, daughters as receptacles, holding, holding, C A N. A D A once she sang. Each word releases vibrations. It's a gorgeous way of looking at history and looking at storytelling. And I want to open up our panel discussion by starting with this aspect of storytelling and the stories that these panelists have uncovered through their groundbreaking work and the silences that have perhaps found a space to be heard. Come on, do you want to start? That's fine. Sorry, so um, speaking of painful memories, I was lifting a box of my old things when I hurt my back when I was moving, so I thought that was very ironic. A bit louder? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so most of us are already familiar with uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's assassination and the violence that ensued against the Sikhs in October and November of 1984 in Delhi and elsewhere. So estimates vary, but around 3,000 Sikh men were killed by Congress organized mobs in the days following Gandhi's assassination um, by her Sikh bodyguards on October 31st, um, which followed sort of decades of unrest in Punjab. So the violence kind of left behind a generation of Sikh widows and families who had suddenly lost many male members of their families. 
Um, and as a result, the Indian government, as a form of compensation, um, provided them with this free housing afterwards. Um, and this area is in Tilaknagar, which is in West Delhi. It's commonly known as the Widow Colony. And it's considered a, quote, designated slum area by the Delhi Development Authority. So I've been working in this neighborhood since 2010. And I lived there between, uh, lived in Delhi between 2012 and 2014, um, doing some ethnographic field work there. And as Naveen mentioned in my work, I sort of focus on gender, urban space, and religious practice um, as a means of coping with sort of long-term structural violence and trauma. And I also discuss the presence of 1984 as a category of identification within the Sikh diaspora, particularly Sikh youth in Canada and commemorations of that event. So I want to quickly just discuss um, one of the stories that I heard um, with this woman that I call her Noor Auntie. I would change um, everyone's names, of course. And uh, this is what she talks about when she um, talked about what happened to her in 1984. So she says, we were all in our homes when we found out about Indra Gandhi. Uh, we'd received 10,000 rupees worth of parts for our cycle shop and your uncle, she's talking about her husband, came with a uh, truck loaded with goods. He said to me, there's a lot of noise happening today in Janmi Jonk. They killed Indra Gandhi. We had no idea what was going to happen. On the morning of the next day, November 1st, my brother-in-law and wife went to get him um, a checkup at the doctor's. They cut his hair. The violence started on that side and then spread to our area. We were sitting at home. I said, I don't want to go anywhere. We took 10,000 rupees from my family to fix up this house, and I, I'm not leaving it. Well, we took our property papers for the house and left them with someone and went to my mother-in-law's house. Those papers were all that was saved. I didn't even have a chunni or a, a scarf on my head or shoes on my feet, and I had a 10-month-old daughter in my lap. We were hidden in our room all day. That evening, someone got the news that there were six living in this house. The mob took my son and threw him against the wall. They tore everything apart, wrestled my daughter away from me, and threw her down. I had to save my son, of course. Um, some of the men in the crowd were better than others. One said to me, Benji, sister, don't cry. Hold your daughter, and I'll bring your son to you. But that's when they began to hit my husband in front of me. They dragged him out onto the street and beat him to death. I pleaded with him, with them to hit us instead and leave him alone. In his last moment, he let go of my hand and said, just go, take care of the children. That's it. For three days, we hadn't eaten. For three months, I couldn't go to the Gurdwara, um, which is a Sikh temple. Otherwise, I used to go twice a day. I couldn't go after that, and I'll never forget this for the rest of my life. Um, they killed him, his two brothers, his brother-in-law, his father, and a couple of relatives here from Punjab. My poor brother-in-law was hiding in a cardboard TV box, and they killed him there. They set some people on fire. I don't know if you feel anything like that. When we were forced to leave that area, there were no men left in our house, just my sons. Um, so what I discovered was that violence was sort of a daily reality in her life um, and continued on throughout 30 years. So in 2010, this woman's son actually was murdered um, in a domestic altercation with his wife's family, uh, and his body was only discovered a couple of weeks later. Um, and so one of the ways that she finds respite, uh, and I, I feel that the women in this community find respite, is their sort of twice daily visits to the Gurdwara and, and doing their daily prayers. Um, I just want to, because we're talking about memory, I want to talk about how some of the women in this neighborhood remember lived violence. Um, so I asked, one of the questions I asked was, how do you remember 1984? Do you remember it daily? Do you have dreams about it? Or do you try not to think about it? Oh, okay. So uh, this is what some of the women had told me. So one woman who I called Jagdish Gaur, she said, Yad to dil me rehti aayin, kabhi bhi nahi bhulte, which means memories stay in your heart. You can never forget them. How those days came for us and what happened, it was a black night for us. I heard that term a lot, black night. But we'll never forget those days. When we go up to God, then we'll forget them. Otherwise, I'll never forget those days. Um, another woman who I called Surinder Gore says, No, dear, these thoughts will never go. They can never go away. These thoughts, can they ever go away? What we have endured, at night sometimes I wake up and I have difficulty breathing. I think, oh my God, what has happened to us? I can't bear it. Sometimes I get up and I start walking, walking a little in the hopes that I might calm down. 
I can't forget, I can't forget them. I cannot forget only when I die. The children are in such a bad state. All of the kids are like this. All of my life has been like this. All of my life, my entire life has been full of suffering. My entire life has passed in worries and pain. What relief will I get? I will not get any relief now. I will die, but I will not get any relief. My entire life I have suffered. My entire life I have not had happiness. It's not something you, forget, you can forget. It's something that is daily, in the morning, evening, when you come home, when you go to work. You become encompassed in your work, but when you come home, it's all of the worries that burden you. It's not the kind of thing you forget. They aren't people that you can forget. These small children I raised, if he, her husband, had been here, I wouldn't have to endure so much pain. At least he was helping me with them, but now all the worry and burden is upon me. Right now, I have to endure the entire burden alone. I'm so troubled, and I want God to take me because I'm so distressed. My heart doesn't even feel like living. Um, so one of the things I noticed was sort of the continuing um, structural violence and poverty was very much affecting the children of this generation. Um, a lot of the uh, male youth um, had issues with substance use, there were a lot of suicides in the neighborhood, um, a lot of domestic altercations, and a lot of these youth didn't have any sort of elderly male figures um, in their life. So I know I'm running out of time, um, so what I want to try to point out partly in my research is how memory is constructed differently by survivors um, and those in the Sikh diaspora who perhaps did not live through 1984 um, or come at it sort of purely through community memory and identity, identity making, um, which I believe uh, we might touch upon a little bit later in the questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kamal, um, for sharing the work that you've done and, and the stories. And we'll definitely get into the questions as well. I'd like to call up next Chandrama. You, actually, if you want, you can stay here. Um, I'm not really sure if Air India is my research project. I know I've been called here because it is my research project, but I'm still figuring out if it is my research project because um, I came to uh, reading, learning, and teaching about the Air India tragedy through my, um, not through research, but through teaching. So when I got my job at McMaster as a new assistant prof in 2008, I was asked to offer a new graduate seminar. Um, and my uh, doctoral work has been on Indian nationalism and masculinity. So I wanted to teach a larger course, and I called it Mapping South Asian Masculinities. And my hope was that I would look at different moments of political crisis in South Asia, and I would you know, have sort of thematic sections in the course. So I taught a section on, you know, I would teach a section on 1947 partition, you know, 1971 Bangladesh war, uh, the uh, civil conflict in Sri Lanka. But of course, this was not a course that I was offering in South Asia or India. So I thought, oh, I should put something that's closer to home. So what would be a political crisis in the Canadian context that my students would be able to uh, sort of relate to something that would have more of a resonance for them? So I thought, of course, Kanishka. I was aware of the Kanishka bombing growing up in India. I hadn't studied about it in the way of sort of teaching it in a course or research. So I started looking for materials on the Air India tragedy. And it was 2008, there was literally nothing except for media reports and some journalistic pieces that had come out. Uh, the only book that was uh, available at that time was the Clark, uh, Bharati Mukherjee Clark Blaze book that had come out, Sorrow and Terror, two years after 1985. So, you know, I, I, I find it uh, in the catalog. And in McMaster, we have a social science and humanities library, and then you have the engineering library and the business library. So, of course, as a humanities um, prof, I show up at Mills, the book is not there. So I'm told, oh, that book is not here. You have to go to Thode Library, which is the engineering um, department. So, so I, you know, that's the first time I've been to Thode Library. I go there and given my sense of direction, of course I can't find the book. <laughs> so then I walk up to the circulation desk and I asked this young man who's sitting there, you know, I'm looking for this particular book. Here is the catalog number. Please, could you help me find it? So he, you know, he, of course, gets up, and then he takes me uh, to this, you know, section of aviation disaster. And I said, 
are you sure the book is here? And he says, yeah, yeah, that's the call number. And then he takes out the book and gives it to me. And as we are walking, we've been talking. And so, you know, he looks Indian. So I ask him, oh, are you from India? And he says, yes, I'm from India. I've actually just come from Chandigarh. Um, I don't recall his name now. He told me his name. And, you know, I've come from Chandigarh, and I'm doing engineering here. I'm an undergrad, and this is my part-time job. So he gives me the book, and then he flips it open, and this says, Sorrow and Terror. What is this book about? So, you know, I say, oh, I'm teaching a course. I'm hoping to teach a course uh, called Mapping South Asian Masculinities. And this is the, uh, a book about the Air India tragedy. So I'm, you know, reading up and, you know, updating my knowledge base so that I can actually teach it. So he looks at me and says, why do you want to teach about the Air India tragedy? So I said, well, it's, you know, it's a Canadian tragedy. It's a, it's a part of our public memory. So that's why. And he looks at me and says, I'm not a terrorist. Right? So I sort of stop, and of course, you know, that um, results in a long conversation. So here is this uh, Sikh man who do he doesn't have a turban, like the typical markers of what we think of a Sikh man. He doesn't have a turban, he doesn't have a beard, uh, you know, this young little boy. And he tells me, you know, why do you want to teach this in your course? Because this is going to uh, suggest to students in your classroom that Sikh equals terrorism and violence. Mm -hmm. So why would you do that, right? So we have this, you know, long conversation. And, and to me, that chance encounter with this young man who had come from India has, I think, um, structured the way I have come to engage with Air India, and that's why I say it's not a research project. I started you know, thinking about Air India as a, as a teaching project, as a way of looking for materials to put on a course, and it continues to be so. Uh, so this sort of chance um, encounter, I think, is you know, really poignant because it pointed out different things to me. One, you know, we often, when we're looking at you know, materials which have since 2008, there has been a lot of publication, you know, books like Children of Air India, Padma Vishwanathan's novel, scholarly articles, etc., have come up. But we often uh, seem to think of the Air India tragedy as a tragedy that is not seen as a Canadian tragedy, uh, losses that have been disavowed by you know, the Canadian government, uh, the majority population. But for me, it is also about the silences within the South Asian community and the way that Air India has been embraced or not embraced. So to me, it is not just the majority minority sort of an issue, but also within the Indian you know, or South Asian community, how Air India raises difficult questions, uh, you know, forces us to encounter difficult knowledges and figure out ways of how to remember otherwise, how to be open to multiple histories, stories, uh, traumas, suffering. So the way sort of, you know, this young man, he doesn't even know that how he's sort of taken me in a particular road. He's probably an engineer somewhere <laughs> in the world. But to me, uh, it has structured, I think, the way I engage with Air India, how to teach um, Air India uh, in, a, in a way that recognizes multiple histories, how, for, uh, to, uh, how to facilitate. And I see my role as an instructor. I see myself as a facilitator. Uh, what I'm trying to do is trying to bring the silence histories, the multiple uh, stories in circulation and, and hopefully make it part of the larger, uh, wider public memory. So how to facilitate multiple histories of suffering to address, to address one another without collapsing one into the other. So for instance, you know, when I teach um, the Air India tragedy or materials or creative remembrances of the Air India tragedy, you know, we talk about British colonial violence. We talk about, you know, Kumagata Maru, 1984, violence against, uh, violence against Sikhs in Delhi in particular, 9-11, and the targeting of the turban. If you, you know, think of 9-11, you know, the first person uh, who was killed as a result of 9-11 is a Sikh man, Balbir Singh, uh, Balbir Singh Sodhi. Uh, Air India families who've been misrecognized, uh, mistreated by the government, and living with the loss of loved ones. So all of these multiple histories of suffering, grief, loss, I think, you know, are sort of different um, currents and confluences, right? Uh, so trying to sort of bring them all in conversation without trying to hierarchize a particular uh, story 
or a particular way of narrativizing history and being open to this multiple narratives. And often this multiple narratives are conflict and you know, they contest each other. Uh, but being open to that and hopefully teaching my students to be open to those you know, multiple voices and multiple stories. Um, so for me, um, my engagement with Air India uh, has been a learning process, I would say. So I see myself more as a learner rather than an you know, sort of educator. Uh, but facilitating my uh, students learning about the Air India tragedy in a way that I hope uh, broadens a sense of uh, inheritance and responsibility to care about the impact of the bombings on our shared present and our future. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chandra Ji. Uh, Milan. I'm in, I have too many things in my hand. I'm in sure, sure. All right. Uh, so my dissertation research focuses on the Air India inquiry and the testimonies of family members of Air India Flight 182 passengers, victims who chose to speak at the inquiry, not forgetting those who didn't give testimony. I look at the Canadian inquiry as a specific site an official setting where each testimony not only shares one's individual memories and experiences, but together act as a collection of voices demanding justice from the Canadian government. I was cautious in my dissertation. I carefully considered each testimony and how someone like me witnessed their statements and shares them. Uh, there's decisions around this for me, ethical care, consideration about other people's experiences, their stories and their trauma. I look at their agency. My presentation today will share a small portion of the family's testimonies as a way to understand the confluence of memory. After all, testimony is one of many versions of their stories. In relation to the Air India tragedy, I can't help but focus on how these stories intersect at the personal, so families as well as ours or us, the publicly shared, the official, and more importantly for me, the masked, the erased, and the silenced. My own understanding of the Air India tragedy began with a fragmented understanding of what happened a, a recollection, uh, I, as I recollected experiences of others. I decided to take on research about, the, about Air India because I was frustrated with the vagueness in the official story, even though it indirectly shaped my own experiences. I was fueled by what was silenced, erased tapes, long trials, insufficient evidence, demands for answers. My storytelling today will also be fragmented as I share intersects, intersections of the personal and the official. Again, I draw attention to the fact that I'm cautious. So some of the stories that I share, I will also be uh, hesitant, or not hesitant, but I'll also be careful in what I am willing to share when I'm speaking about other people's experiences and their memories. So the official. On June 23rd, 1985, two flights departing from Canadian soil were targeted by a terrorist attack. There were two explosions and there were two planes involved. It was later revealed that passenger bags filled with explosives were transferred onto two separate flights leaving Vancouver International Airport in British Columbia, Canada. The first passenger bag containing a bomb, bomb was transferred onto Air India Flight 301. This bag detonated prematurely killing two baggage handlers at the Tokyo Narita Airport. The second bag was transferred from Canadian Pacific Flight uh, 086 onto Air India Flight 182. The bomb in the bag detonated mid-flight over the Atlantic Ocean near the coast of Ireland, killing all 329 passengers and members of the crew on board the aircraft. 280 of the passengers on flight 182 were Canadian citizens. Or was it 279, according to the CBC? Or was it 268, according to another article written in uh, the Vancouver Sun, or what Wikipedia states? Or was it most, as the Canadian government? Uh, again, talking about the fragments of how we understand and what we know about Air India and the caution that we take when we need to research this type of work. The personal in the official setting. I'm taking us to that same time, to June 23, 1985, a moment in the testimonies that I included in my dissertation. Uh, Mr. Freeman, one of the commission councillors, speaking to uh, an individual who was a, a rescue worker at the site of the crash. Mr. Freeman states, all right, so let me take you back, sir, to the day of the Air India disaster, June 23rd, 1985. First, can you help us a little and tell us about, well, let's talk about what happened that day. What do you recall? Mr. Murphy, the fisherman who went to the rescue site. Well, 
The first thing I recall is the Sunday morning. I was on my way to Mass for 9 o'clock, and I was going... I was going in the door of the church when I met, met a man called Eugene O'Sullivan. He's known as Gene Sullivan. He told me he works with the Valencia radio station, which is a marine station on the Valencia. He told me that they had a report that an airline uh, had gone off the screen in Shannon, off the radar screen in Shannon, and they were wondering what happened. Uh, when we were going out, like I said, I was very anxious that we would reach the area the correct area for the search area. But once we came within about 10 minutes of the area, maybe six or seven miles, there was no mistaking, mistaking it because we saw activity in the distance of the helicopters in the distance, and we also saw the debris of the plane crash. I mean, there was just wreckage strewn all over the sea. Mr. Freeman, tell us a little bit about what you saw then in terms of the wreckage and its extent and magnitude, Mr. Murphy. We were certainly five or six miles away from the main search area when we came across some wreckage on the water. I mean, you couldn't mistake it. There were pieces of suitcases. There was everything you could imagine from a plane, uh, from a plane was floating on the water. It was when we moved cl closer to the main search area that we started to see some bodies in the water. And at that point, I'm going to stop because, again, uh, stop that, that part of the story uh, because, again, I caution drawing attention to other stories and the reception of these stories in the audience because they also start impacting us. And this is part of the ethics, I believe, in when we're telling stories and who's willing to witness the stories um, and what we do to others when we do this type of research. So at the same date, I'm still in on June 23rd, 1985, I look at families in Canada, the personal in an official setting. I recall one of the testimonies of, uh, of one of the family members discussing, uh, discussing at the commission their experience of first finding out about the, about the bombings. They say, it was after 9 a.m. in the UK. The plane had already been bombed. Hearing the news, my sister was the first to find out about the bombing. Her colleague told her, my phone rang at 9 o'clock. My brother told me the news. When we went to the Air India office, then, sorry, pardon me, then we went to the Air India office. When I reached the Air India office, it was degrading to know that the staff of the office and the RCMP, who was president in the Air India office, had not yet phoned or contacted Ireland. Eight hours had passed. Radios were talking about the topic for hours. When we asked the authorities what did they know, they said, we are also just hearing the news from the radio. Instead of contacting Cork, the RCMP were trying to stop me told me to go home and be quiet. They had no information. In fact, they were given more, in fact, they were more, even more unaware that the common people, than the common people listening to the radio. We asked them to let us go to Ireland, but they refused for three days. These three days felt like three years. We were hooked to the radio. The personal also looks for answers. The stories of others, uh, there's the stories of others then and how they experienced uh, the Air India bombing um, shortly after, 1986, 1987, and so on. Uh, the last testimony or part of the testimony that I'll share uh, from my presentation is from another family member who was recalling um, some of the experiences that he, that he had uh, in 1986. I was so angry, uh, I'm quoting him now, I was so angry I stopped going to Hindu and Sikh temples. I still do not go. I stopped praying even to God. Before, in our house, we used to pray before dinner every day, and we went to the temple every week. After crash, I felt abandoned and truly alone. I used to lock my doors Friday evening and unlock them only to go to work on Monday. Over the years, I have been offered great jobs, but I declined them. I do not need the prestige, and I would not take the position unless I could give my 100%. I know that I cannot. It looks like I'm living, but, I'm already, but I am like a dead body moving around. After a year, I started praying and believing in God again. Some days, I, some days I like to believe that my daughter is still alive. I think that she could have, an, could have amnesia being picked, up by the, by, being picked up by a Spanish fisherman and is living a life in Spain. In 1986, I went by myself to Spain, to a Spanish town where the commercial fisherman docked and made a poster with the poster offering a reward of $100,000. I put these posters all over the town and in the newspapers. People think I'm crazy, but miracles do happen. 
I still do not have, I still have not performed her last burial rites. I think that this is the reason that I have not changed my phone number and moved from my house since 1985. The stories continue for 20 years, intersecting with other fragments of how 1984 and 1985 fact and other incidences impact those directly or indirectly. Each of these stories, and as I've been uh, working through my research pro project, again with caution, I've drawn attention to the minute I say, oh, my research is on the Air India tragedy. At that point, I often pause and I listen to the stories of others, uh, whether it's of family members who were flying to Japan on June 22nd and their experience, or listening to others who have spoken about being in, in Delhi in 1985 and receiving phone calls saying they should leave the city, or recalling other stories about how when the Crown first discovered evidence that had been erased here in Canada. I just wanted to end by saying, uh, saying that the complications around topics like Air India, around Air India, um, need to be taken with ethical and cautious consideration. And even the testimonies that I work with are just one version of the stories that these families have been talking about for, for years. Um, and that this confluence is important not only amongst topics, but within the topic as well. Thank you so much, Milan, for sharing your story and sharing the work that you've done. Um, and finally, good preaching. No problem. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to acknowledge that we are all at unceded Coast Terrace territory. Those were really good stories by Milan, Kamal, and Chandrima. And uh, I would only like to draw a link between all those stories but wonderfully told by these researchers. And I will be talking from Gadar's standpoint. I don't want to share my personal memories. Only thing I would like to briefly say, I was 14 when the Operation Blue Star happened and I was in Amritsar and the devastated building of Akal Takht and its image is still, still here in my mind, it's still very fresh. Same way, I do not forget uh, the imagery of the Air India wreckage floating in the, in the sea that I saw on the TV. So those memories are still very fresh with me. When I say Gadar's standpoint, I first want to mention what, what I mean. Gadar means mutiny, which is an Urdu word used by the British to refer to the first mutiny that happened in India in 1857, when India was under British occupation. That was the first war of independence. And British had referred to that uh, act as mutiny, or in Urdu they used the word Gadar. And that uh, first rebellion was, of course, uh, crushed with an iron fist. In 1913, the South Asian radicals who were in North America, they formed Gadar Party. And they appropriated that name, that word, on purpose because the party was known as Hindi Pacific Association. It was found by the South Asian radicals in the US. Most of them came here for better livelihood as British subjects because India was under British occupation. While working here in US and Canada, they encountered blatant racism. And in any event of racial violence, they never got any help from the British embassy or the British consulates. And they soon realized that the root cause of our suffering is uh, the foreign occupation back home. So that's how they started getting organized. They formed Hindi Pacific Association, which fought against racism abroad and against uh, foreign occupation back home. And on 1st of November 1913, they launched the newspaper called Gadar. So they appropriated that word. That's how the party came to be known as Gadar Party, because that paper became very popular with its radical content. And their mandate was to get rid of uh, British in India by using weapons, arms, and they wanted an armed revolution. And they denounced Gandhian ways. But in the end, they wanted to establish a secular and egalitarian society in post-British India. And repeatedly, they emphasized on people's unity. And they asked the Indians to keep aside their religious divisions. 
So, if you read Gadar history, if you read Gadar testimonies, if you read their diaries, if you read their interviews or their poetry, you will find they repeatedly emphasize on people's unity and, and secularism. In 1914, they decided to return to India to launch a revolution with the help of the Indian soldiers working for the British armies. Uh, because the British were engaged in a war with Germany, so they thought it's the right time to strike. But things didn't, didn't go their way, didn't, didn't materialize because people weren't prepared for an armed revolution. So they didn't get enough support. Popular leadership was not ready for any kind of bloodshed. And uh, the clergy was also pro-British. And British also succeeded in penetrating their spies in the movement. And eventually the movement was crushed. But nevertheless, Gadar kept erupting in different forms afterwards. And uh, I would say Gadar movement continued even after, that's my claim, even after India got independence in 1947. And that's the reason some of the former Gadarites, they joined even ultra-leftist Naxal movement. One of them, Bhuja Singh, was killed in a fake encounter. So Gadars, Gadarites continued their struggle for a uh, just society. And they never accepted the official freedom. They saw it as a transfer of power between the British and the natives. The important milestone in the Gadar history is uh, the partition of India. India was divided on religious line. Muslim Pakistan came into being. And it happened in 1947, the same year India got its independence. And keeping to their words, Gadarites tried to save Muslims on the Indian side of the border. And Son Singh Bhakna, who was the founding president of Gadar Party, he, he received death threats. But even then, he tried to save Muslims from the Hindu and Sikh mobs. Why I'm mentioning this? Because this shows that they, they had a complete resolve in the ideology of secularism. And I want to draw your attention to the story of an individual whose name was Hari Singh Sund. He was one of the Gadarites in Vancouver, and he was the one who killed Bela Singh. Bela Singh was a British spy who was responsible for a shootout in the Sikh temple, which happened after Kamagata Maru, and that shootout claimed two lives by Park Singh, by Badan Singh, two of our community elders, they died in that violence. And Hari Singh soon actually killed Bela Singh when, he, when Bela Singh went back to India. So Hari Singh soon died on 23rd of June in 1958. Now it's an interesting coincidence, exactly 27 years after his death, in 1985, Air India tragedy happens. And people who died in the Air India tragedy, they belong to different faith groups. Among the dead were the Sikhs, the Muslims, the Hindus, the Christians. So it was an attack on the Indian diversity. And we have to figure out what went wrong during the time period between the year Hari Singh soon died and the year Air India tragedy happened. All this was the culmination of the dangerous mix of religion and politics in India, which was totally, totally against the ideology of the Gadar party. Had our leaders or society followed Gadar ideals, this wouldn't have happened. Because in 1980s, uh, Things weren't very good, and the Sikh leadership in Punjab was seeking some extra right for the religious minority group of the Sikh community and also uh, uh, some benefits for Punjab. But instead of redressing those grievances, the, the Congress government, which was in the center in Delhi, which, is, uh, which claims to be secular, it tried to play some dirty tricks. It actually um, propped up a Sikh extremist movement to counterweight Akali Dal. So, Slowly and gradually, things went out of hand. And okay, sure. So, shall I conclude it now? Okay. So, mainly, I want to say that um, this was the culmination of uh, the politics that was being played in India. The politics and religion were being mixed. And on 1st of November 1984, anti-Sikh violence happened. And incidentally, on 1st of November 1913, Gadar newspaper was launched. So, we have to see between the um, between these uh, two uh, historic developments, how, what, what went wrong and why it, was, why it went wrong. So that's the reason why 
Air India happened, and even today, this history is very relevant. And because we have forgotten the legacy of the Gadarites, that's why we have a government in India under Narendra Modi, uh, who is a BJP leader who was responsible for 2002 anti-Muslim massacre. And Hindutva extremists have become emboldened under this government. So Gadar will remain relevant. And that's the lesson we need to learn. Thank you so much. Gopichi, thank you so much, and, and my apologies for cutting your time short. It was just because we have to have some questions from the audience as well, too. But the, one of the themes that I'm seeing emerge from these wonderful speakers um, is this, uh, and, and it really struck me with Gummel's um, talk, this, this empathy, this empathy that comes naturally when you hear these stories. Um, but at the same time, you know, do you face a struggle in your own relationship to your work? Um, not just being an outsider, but just emotionally. <laughs> Where do you park these stories after you're done? Gamal, did you want to talk to that? Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Um, you asked the hard question first. <laughs> um, some, of the, some of my friends in the audience know my struggles with this project. Um, definitely a couple of struggles. Um, one is that sort of feeling of being an outsider as well as an insider. So being a female, being a sick, having the women treat me like I'm a daughter or a niece, um, you know, definitely did make me feel like an insider. Um, I also have family from Amritsar who um, no one passed away, but, you know, histories of partition in my family and people disappearing in the 40s um, kind of is very relevant to me. So, um, but then on the other hand, you know, I live with immense privilege. I'm Canadian, I have a passport, I can leave Delhi whenever I want, um, as well as the sort of socioeconomic privilege that I have, um, caste and skin privilege as well. Mm. Um, so some of the difficulties um, that I faced was I, I was there during the Delhi gang rape. Uh, it had happened a week after I landed in Delhi. Um, and that definitely changed the sort of the structure of everyday life for me and all of the women around me. Um, so working during that time was very difficult, I would say. Um, and then also, uh, as some of you know, I came down with typhoid and dengue <laughs> during field work. But I mean, these things are just indicative of sort of the everyday reality of the women that I was working with. It's just what they were going through, I was going through in, in terms of the structural stuff around the city of Delhi. Um, and I didn't really understand the stigma of widowhood until my own father had passed away during my PhD as well. And, and seeing how, um, you know, my mother's life changed after that, for sure. Um, so there is a sense of feeling an immense pressure to do this work because we are um, South Asian, we are part of the community, and also a gendered sense, um, which we sort of had touched upon in that women are often sort of the storytellers of our community. Um, and so there's a sense that this, you know, because uh, personally, like, you know, it seems that all of us are very empathetic, and so these stories sort of need to come forward, and they come from that part. Um, and we talked about this uh, in private conversations as well, but we talked about sort of women as being, um, particularly in this community, vessels of remembrance. And so... I look at the women in the widow colony as vessels of remembrance, but then I also think of myself as sort of a vessel of remembrance as well. Um, and so in a similar sense, people who work with these issues, I think, are also these, you know, memory vessels. But definitely, I think, anyone who does this kind of work, um, there is a lot of vicarious trauma, and so that's why it's important to have um, forums like these and colleagues who, you know, work on the same issue so that you can sort of move through that work with empathy, but also um, a sense of dignity and still, you know, feeling like you're able to do that work as well. Yeah. Sometimes the vessel fills up. You need to let this let Exactly. Go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, I sort of, you know, narrated one story as sort of uh, the teaching project. Uh, I, as when um, 
Naveen introduced me, you heard that I have uh, started doing interviews with Air India families, and I have been doing that for the last two years. And I also, you know, sort of similar to what Kamal has been um, saying, uh, again, I didn't think of it as a research project. It was trying to gather teaching resources, trying to see how I could make conversations around Air India be part of the curriculum. So I started doing, you know, special editing special issues, uh, doing an anthology thing as a way, as a means of bringing that conversation in the classroom and having that conversation beyond the classroom. Uh, but when the Malaysian Airlines went off air, something happened to me. Again, you, know, you talked of you know, vicariously living. And I had never thought of Air India as my project. I had not lost a family member. I have been you know, similar to Milan, reading the testimonies, you know, having conversations with people like Rene and Padma Vishwanathan and others. But it was you know, something that I thought about, but nothing, not something that I researched on. I wasn't you know, write, going to write a paper on it. But once Malaysian Airlines went off the air, um, I couldn't sleep. I, I felt very, very sick. And, uh, and you know, I, I had conversations with my department chair, colleagues who do oral history projects, and they suggested to me, either you need to stop teaching Air India, just move away from this, or you need to have conversations with the families. Because this has somehow, like, it's a strange way to say it, somehow Air India has seeped into my consciousness, my soul, and somehow it has become my trauma. And I don't know how, I don't have an answer to it. Mm -hmm. And it's not a project that I thought, okay, now I'm going to write a book on Air India. Even the interviews that I have been doing, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. Mm -hmm. And people keep asking me, are you going to write a book? And I say, I don't know. So why are you doing them, right? I don't have you know, funding for it, it's not like I have a grant. Grant, but you know I have been having these conversations. Yesterday, I you know I flew in from Toronto and I went to New Westminster to ha do an interview with this lovely uh, old lady, not young lady, 88 years old. And it's not uh, that she had you know very much to offer in terms of the narratives that I have been gathering, but just having that conversation was worthwhile. And in that conversation, she said to me, you know, you came, we are all old and we are dying. Soon these stories will not be part of our history. So I'm so grateful you came. And I was saying, I'm so glad you talked to me, right? So again, you know, how, when do somebody else's trauma become yours? How do traumas travel? And often it's, you know, unknown. I'm, and I don't have an answer, but, you know, how do you sort of respect those stories, those memories, and, you know, do you make it a researcher's project, uh, or is it, you know, a part of our shared history, and we see ourselves as, at least, I see myself as a facilitator, mm -hmm. as a collaborator, and sort of bringing this conversation to the table. That's mm -hmm. how I see myself, you know, I don't see myself as a researcher working on Air India, mm -hmm. but somehow I am into this conversation with different community folks, families, and somehow I'm in there, but I don't think I have a title, <laughs> right? So, yeah. That's, that's really well said. Um, and for Milan, I mean, I, I appreciated the, the, the warning you gave us before you spoke, but I don't think any of us were prepared for what you shared with us. I mean, where do you park a story about a man who's posting posters across Spain looking for his missing daughter? Like, what do you do with that? So uh, for me, when it comes to the struggle, the relationship, and what do you do with this work? Um, so for me, every step of the way since I started looking at Air India, and I realized today, or when I was preparing for this, I think the first time I ever wrote anything about this was uh, about 12 years ago. Um, uh, if I can calculate, if I was calculating back, if I'm maybe not, I'm not a good mathematician. Um, so, but every step of the way for me was making sure that I wasn't overstepping. Uh, and I think that's a really important element that, that I, that I uh, have tried to incorporate in anything that I do around this type of work. Um, so I'm lucky that I had a great, I had a, an amazing supervisory committee, uh, my supervisors here, who I give a lot of credit to, um, who helped me work through those cautions. In fact, there was times when I was quite cautious about what I was doing and I was being pushed to look at different uh, elements of the research. Um, but I think that making sure that I wasn't overstepping. So there's decisions for me to not interview family members, as an example, um, just because when I read their testimonies, they have these testimonies, um, and some of them didn't want to be interviewed. Some of them chose not to, some of them chose not to speak at the at the inquiry. Some of them chose to speak to other outlets, as Gabriel 
genos as well, right? Uh, to journalists, for example. And so it's always making sure that I was able to go, as, especially as a PhD student, um, was making sure that I wanted to go through the material as, as carefully as I could, as cautiously as I could, without restricting myself uh, to these stories um, in a way that, that kind of examined the material that, was, that I had in front of me and I could really understand it in a deep way before taking those next steps before uh, br bringing up these stories to people, whether it was family members or audience members um, that might not be ready to hear them, uh, I, I stopped I stopped the stories, um, even though they're publicly accessible. There's, there's uh, Sometimes you put other people in these situations. Uh, my mom is, and my dad are key examples when, during my research, I would call them and, and read parts of the testimony. And then I had this moment, I think, uh, when I was writing one of my chapters saying, you, you should, you you, that's not fair. You shouldn't necessarily be putting someone else in that position to witness yeah. what you're witnessing um, through these texts. So that's why I know I bring out the word caution a lot, but I think it's something that's, uh, that's a strength mm -hmm. in, in how you approach these types of topics and not a weakness necessarily. Amazing. Uh, Gurpreeti, I mean, I was struck by, by your presentation as well because unlike the other pres presenters, the work you're doing deals with a story that the actual participants are, are no longer there. And so you're really delving into this idea of the living memory or the memory that lives on afterwards with these with the other party. Uh, and it's interesting because you also have to then take away what's been layered on afterwards in terms of how people remember the movement and sort of peel back the layers. How does that work in your in your texts and your journalism and your activism in terms of finding that 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 real story at the bottom at the bottom? Uh, it did it's very embarrassing that I, I sometimes feel that I'm a sentimental fool. <laughs> sometimes I really get carried away by the stories of these kind of individuals. Yeah. And um, often I lose my mind. And um, of, I mean, in recent months, I have started writing poems in Punjabi on these kind of issues. Wow. Wow. So maybe it's part of that. But at the same time, when I met the Air India families, I also got a lot of hope from them, especially Dr. Chandra Sekhar, Sankuratri, and A.V. Nantaraman. Both these individuals, they lost their wives and children, and they were left alone. Hmm. Still, they found a better way of dealing with their situation. Now they are um, running schools and hospitals for needy children in India. And they have, like a, in a way, forgiven the killers, which is something very encouraging. People have a tendency to forgive. I learned it from Air India families and in some other instances too. I just want to quickly mention one, uh, one thing which really bothered me. I got a call from a so-called intellectual in our community from Toronto. He read my book on the Air India families and he was upset. He said, how come they are not angry? How come they are not seeking revenge against the people who did it? So I had to calm him down. I told him that I cannot adulterate their stories. It's their stories, you ask them. They, have, they had the courage, but you people, you you have nothing to lose. I mean, you were just uh, taking catharsis out of this. Mm. So those things really disturb you, bother you uh, as a reporter, as a journalist, because we also are human beings. We are not robots. Right. Right. I mean, uh, the, the one regret I have, unfortunately, is that the time <laughs> moves along. And I want to open up um, this discussion to the audience as well. But first, I'd like to call upon uh, Renee to sort of introduce us into this next phase of the discussion. From Children of Air India, Unauthorized Exhibits and Interjections, and Interjection. Witness number redacted. Name redacted. Air India Inquiry. A 12-year-old boy, darling of the house, so pampered, suddenly turned orphan. Very few Relatives, very hard for me to explain all these years and grew up learning how mean this world. No one ever cared to ask. The, 
This has been uh, an amazing uh, evening, and it still continues on, and Am is on the side here to help point the microphone to anybody who would like to ask a question. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, thanks very much, very touching and insightful. I just wanted to come back on this issue of forgiveness and whether that was a theme you picked up in Delhi and in other kinds of things, because there's one is for forgiveness at a personal level, there's the other of, of government action and example and the law and all of that. And how were these two reconciled? Because obviously this pattern is a recurring one. And how does one resolve the personal versus that of the law and order machinery of the country? Thank you. Kamal, Milan, Chandrama, did you want to address this? Uh, I, I'm the one to go first. Um, it's a difficult question to ask um, because of, of how, from what I, my research is, to see on one level you have family members or other community members, in, uh, not just Air India and other incidences, um, looking for the state, uh, looking for the government to, to support them and to react, right, in some form of forgiveness. But uh, there's also a, the difficulty then when there is an official apology like we know with Air India or when there is other forms of memorialization that occur at the state level, the challenge ends up being, um, is it, is it what the, those who are suffering want? Um, is it done in the way they would like it to be done? And so there's an important, I mean, it, it can be a, a good, there can be a good moment, right? When, uh, when family members, for example, get the recognition that they want, but there's also the, the trouble of, of that redress process as well, where sometimes it becomes a way for the state to forget even further. And that's what I'd like to, to be careful with when I start either, when I, think about some of the processes that occur, like official apologies, for example. Um, to what extent do they create a silencing in themselves, and do they put an end to a story or an end to an incident without allowing us to continue having discourse and dialogue on, on these important topics? Um, so I hear you on the, I hear your question, and I, and I think it's quite complicated, especially when that's usually the outlet or the way that we, as communities or groups that have experienced injustices, turn to. Um, but then the, the result sometimes isn't always um, the way it should be. Kamal, did you want to add to that? Um, ooh, okay. I think there's a, uh, in the work that I've done, there doesn't seem to be a lot of forgiveness from people who have survived this trauma. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is um, the presence that 1984 has on not only the national imaginary, but the diasporic imaginary as well. So for example, in, in Delhi, every year around October 31st, all of the media cameras, CNN, IBN, NDTV, et cetera, et cetera, come down and start filming um, the neighborhood. And every time there's an election in Delhi, it becomes a contentious issue. Um, and we've seen this transnationally when Canadian elections are going on that, uh, you know, for example, a leader like Jack Layton made a statement about 84, Mulcair. So um, this is something that the diaspora and sort of transnational boundaries are not letting go. Um, and so that, I think, plays into sort of that presence of this trauma is just being so kind of like an every everyday thing. Um, the other thing that's very particular about this community is what does it mean and how can one forgive when everyone around you in the neighborhood has gone through the same trauma? And the reason that you're living in that neighborhood is because you have gone through this trauma. Um, so, you know, you might not have any contact with any of these people before 1984, but suddenly all of the people who have gone through this trauma are now your neighbors, right? And so one of the things I look, about, look at is the spatiality of violence too. What does it mean when everyone in a neighborhood has gone through the same thing? Um, and so I think that also makes it particularly dif uh, difficult to forgive. And also just the sheer numbers of the violence. So when you've lost you know, 10 to 15 male members of your family um, in such a grievous way that, you know, Overcoming that kind of trauma, I think, is like is a lifelong thing, um, and so you 
you might be able to forgive, but it, you, you don't forget it, right? It's in the materiality around you, in the space around you. Um, and you can see it manifest itself in all your loved ones as well. So, yeah. Just quickly comment. Um, I think with, my, um, with the interviews I've done so far, I would say it's sort of different levels. So when we say forgive, forgive who? Is it the state? Is it the community? It's sort of, you know, your neighbors and citizens around you? Or is it sort of individuals, you know, who supposedly put the bomb? So who are we talking of in terms of forgiveness? So for some families, uh, it is uh, the state. So they hold the state responsible for uh, no, its uh, non-acknowledgement of of uh, Canadians as Canadians because uh, as racialized minorities. For others, it's, you know, justice has not been served, tapes have been erased, so they're, you know, they, they feel that Canada has let them down. For others, it has been neighbors and communities. So some people will say, you know, I'm carrying this grief, but I have to go out like nothing's happened, and I go to my job, but inside I'm dying. But I have to hide that grief and carry on on with my everyday life because nobody else cares. So I guess, you know, when we're talking of forgiveness, who, who to forgive? Because there are so many levels of letting down as the families feel. So I, th I think it's personal, right? So for each individual, it would be different. No, that, that's so powerful a statement to make and, and so thoughtful from all of you to share your, your, your experiences. Fareed, the last question, Fareed. Yep. Thank you, that was a great presentation. I, I'm listening to the stories and the presentations. How is this different from other trauma that's happened by other victims from other places? As an example, com people coming in from Syria right now or from Afghanistan or anywhere else. How can we take this example and explain to those that have either recently arrived or those within diaspora, as Gurpreet mentioned, that revenge and this type of action, violent action, is not acceptable. Gurpreetji or Achandramaji, anyone? I think if we can think of it as our shared memory and shared history, I think we can move a step forward rather than thinking of, you know, this is this community's trauma, right, in terms of the Syrian crisis or others. If we can open up our hearts and, as I said, you know, broaden a sense of inheritance as this is part of our, our trauma and we are somehow either complicit as, you know, whether witnesses or, you know, reading testimonies or seeing families as bystanders. So. Um, and also, I guess, often traumas are hierarchized, right? So, and often um, it's sort of, you know, certain traumas take over compared to others. So, um, and, and I don't think that helps, helps, right? Like, you know, whose trauma, so we, we sort of, it becomes a victim competition narrative, right? I have to prove that I'm more of a victim. And then also when often we try uh, to think of ourselves as victim, we also forget that we can be perpetrators in another context. So I think if we are willing to, you know, sort of see ourselves both from the outside and you know looking, and looking inwards, I think you know we've moved a step forward. That would be my. Milan, yeah, Milan. Uh, I think there's also something about learning, uh, learning from the from individuals who've experienced it. So, for instance, the testimonies. I don't look at the family members um, in that. Oh, they've only experienced this type of plight. But they're active agents, right? And they're telling the Canadian government. They're making statements about what the Canadian government could have done to improve their situation. The types of information that they required. Um, and this is not just the Air India. Uh, inquiry alone. This is also Maharar, right? I remember. I, I mean, there's the, there's a set of uh, of recommendations and testimonies within these within these spaces where, if we look at people and we look at them as active agents and we look at the way they uh, make statements or make claims to their governments, um, there's also that official level, right? That I think is really important. Is how can we not take some of the specific uh, demands and actions that groups are making uh, and 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 figure out a way of creating policy of, of um, that policies or even other ways of taking uh, these traumas uh, to learn from them in a, in a more active way instead of instead of just using them as their testimonies and kind of ending it there 
um, especially with uh, some of the other inquiries, the murdered and missing indigenous women, uh, the Air India inquiry, sometimes the reaction and the response from the government or from the official voice uh, around it ends up not being, not recognizing that there's action points that can be taken out of these, out of these incidents. So I think that's one way that we can start learning, um, uh, learning from uh, from or drawing parallels too, I should also add to some of the to the some of the reoccurring themes that we're seeing here. Thank you so much, Milan. Kamal, did you want to say something? Um, yeah. So, I think in particular with regards to 1984, one of the ways in which it's different it was that it was a very um, gendered violence. But one of the things I try to do in my work is I don't like using the term 1984 because I I try to sort of de-eventify. The violence, so you know, 1984 or Air India 1985, is 86, 87, 88, all the way you know to the present. Um, and I, I feel like the the daily violence in these instances is almost just as grievous as those particular days. Um, and the other thing I think is really interesting is when Millen was speaking, she uh, one of the um, Serv uh, one of the family members had this quote that said, you know, I stopped praying even to God. And that's something very similar that came in, in the stories that I heard. And so I think one of the ways we can um, make sense of this is to realize that although the particular particularities of traumatic events are quite different, um, some physiological and emotional responses can be very similar. Um, and so we see that theme, you know, whether it could be a temporary loss of faith or permanent loss of faith, um, or particular you know issues that come up around the body and and health issues and things like that. Um, there seem to be a lot of, of the similarities echoing through those those statements as well. Thank you, thank you so much for that. And and I, I just love to say that you know um, I, I'm glad that each one of you sort of spoke to this idea of at the confluence there. As I said earlier, there isn't the equation, there isn't the hierarchy, there isn't the, the cause and effect, there's, there's the story, the story that binds through themes of what the shared experience is. I'd like to thank Gurpreetji, Chandramaji, Gamal, and Milan for coming and sharing your work with us today. And I'm sure the stories will continue offline. Thank you. Right. Um, so the second part of the evening will begin shortly. We'll have a short break for about five minutes and continue after that. Great. To begin with, uh, my name is Michael Blusheim, Director of Cultural Programs here at SFU Woodwards. Um, we are delighted uh, to be a co-presenter um, on this project, Air India Redacted. Uh, this has been a project long in the making, and um, I'd like to introduce the um, panelists this evening, or our guest uh, artists, who really are the driving force behind the creation of this. To begin with, I'm going to start with Owen Underhill, who is basically the true, um, as it were, cause of why this whole thing has been created. He is a composer and also a conductor. Um, he's a long-standing professor of music at SFU. And also, he is the artistic director of Turning Point Ensemble. Welcome, Owen. And. Renee Sacklicker, one of the recent credits, uh, we all know that she has written this wonderful piece, um, as well as been the material source for Children of Air India, which has been the creation behind Air India Redacted. Uh, she has been recently uh, appointed inaugural Poet Laureate City of Surrey. Congratulations for that recent announcement. And Jorgen Simpson was born in Dublin. He is the composer of this piece. His work, international work, spans multiple mediums and approaches including electric, electroacoustic works, opera, music for film, dance, and sound installations. He's the director of the Center for Computational Musicology and Computer Music at the University of Limerick. Welcome. I just want to read this quote. It's a beautiful quote. So, I love to think of my music as a confrontation between opposing elements, finding lines to connect the most unlikely of associations. On one hand, there is my fascination with organic electronics, whilst on the other, there is a deep affinity with melody, tonality, and drama. I want to seduce the audience and simultaneously discover myself. Wow. <laughs> Welcome. I couldn't, I couldn't think of actually a better choice in terms of a composer for this particular project. But I'm going to go to you, Owen. And to begin with, um, you've been on this project many long years, and this has had a whole long cycle to it. And 
truly, uh, if I'm correct, it, it is in two parts in terms of how this version of it, Air India came to be. Do you want to just take us through the, um, the point at which you started and why you started on this project and then where we've ended up? Well, I think, uh, first of all, to acknowledge that the project started in Ireland and uh, that it uh, started with the director of Cork Midsummer Festival and really of the resonance of the uh, Air India Flight 182 within Ireland until you go there and experience that or meet people. I think Canadians have no idea of the importance of this incident and, and the resonance still. So it started there and Jurgen was involved really from the beginning. Uh, the idea was that it would become a international Canadian-Irish project. Push Festival got involved. Mm -hmm. Push Festival brought in Turning Point Ensemble and we were delighted as an ensemble that likes to do uh, interdisciplinary work that likes to take on projects that maybe other people wouldn't take on and other organizations wouldn't take on. So we, we came in right away. And there was an earlier version of this project, which was a, a kind of an opera with a capital O, shall we say. And I noticed that Naveen called this work an opera. So we, we were not using that word. This is sort of a, a non-opera opera that we have uh, created. And, and, you know, that went through a lot, lot of iterations. And then in 2013, Renee's book came out. And I'd already been working on this project for three or four years, and, I, and, and Jürgen even longer. And, and I, I read uh, Renee's book, and I, I was amazed by, by the book, by the quality of the book as poetry, and the way it sort of tells multiple histories, actually, multiple stories, and comes at... Um, Air India and the children of Air India from individuals from the before time, from the after time, even from hearing a couple of poems. If you don't, you should get the book if you don't have it already. And so I just thought, wow, this is amazing. Here we are working on this Air India project and, and Rene has written this amazing book. And I, I, I told Jürgen about it and then I just put it in the mail to him. <laughs> Uh, and and Jurgen got it, and uh, he can talk about it himself. But he thought about it for a while, and he said, he, "I think he said something like, in another, in another world, this would be the perfect way to create the piece." And I thought, "Yes, that's that's right." And then after a little while, he said, "I I actually want to restart the piece and create a new piece on Rene's poetry." And that actually wasn't so long ago. Right. So so and 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 um, you know we've been sort of dedicated to making this piece happen. I think it's important that the piece happen. I think it's important for Jürgen. It's been important for all of us who've been working on it, but it's also important to bring uh, the, the Air India Redacted as a new piece uh, to a Vancouver audience. So that's kind of how it started, and it's really an entirely new project. And the only other thing I would say is I would say that the, the earlier project to create it as an opera with individual characters trying to tell stories was actually quite hard dramaturgically, you know, because you could deal with the, uh, you know, some of the individuals and then the bombing happened and what happened after. And mm -hmm. if there were only characters that was a traditional narrative, it was actually a very difficult and I think limiting Kind of kind of problem, mm -hmm. and then when went to look at Rene's book of poetry and all the different stories there and all the different ways mm -hmm. that they could be brought out in music, I think was a very freeing thing and also a grounding thing uh, from from Rene's own personal experience and living all those years trying to figure out how to uh, write this uh, amazing book that she wrote. So. So I'm glad that we were working on it long enough for this book to come out and that we're finally able to bring the project forward. Fantastic. Um, Jürgen, uh, in regards to um, anchoring yourself in terms of where you start with some, a work like this, where the structure is very unusual, and as Owen cited, the issue of uh, avoiding a linear structure, which really doesn't work. I mean, um, and this is, I gather... Um, um, the poems are from different perspectives, and so how, how and what, what drives you to sort of um, to, to decide what the wellspring is on this piece, and how do you go from where do you create a center in this thing? 
Okay. Um, well, I'd just like to say, first of all, that it's a privilege to have experienced uh, the discussion earlier on and to be talking about this. Um, I think the, the first thing to say is that a project like this, um, when you are approached initially to write a work which addresses and engages with uh, something as, uh, as an incredibly delicate um, and uh, which, which uh, it demands a, a huge de amount of time and uh, a, a, a point must be reached where you feel that you have in a way um, embodied the, 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 the delicacy of the issues in question. Mm -hmm. And as Owen has already pointed out, the project initially started from a dramaturgically linear perspective. Mm -hmm. One which in fact is very much also uh, um, built around a methodology. And the methodology of opera with a capital O mm -hmm. is actually quite clear. Mm -hmm. you know, you are, and it's a bit like film. Uh, if you're writing a mm -hmm. film, you have a script writer, the, sc the script goes through various different levels, and then you finally you, know, you engage a cinematographer, and you engage uh, uh, actors, and you, you, you have a linear process. And in many ways, operatic uh, method methodologies mm -hmm. work in this way. So as a composer, when you're, when, when you're engaged, and I've written operatic works before, when you're engaged to write in this particular manner, your initial response is, to, in a way, to decipher what the methodology needs to be and who the collaborative partners, partners are. And I've actually worked, prior to working with Rene, two, um, two uh, uh, librettists. On the uh, same project. On the same project, which is... So this is the third <laughs> person to try, to, you know... Um, uh, which which is is, uh, is is kind of incredible in itself, and I had uh, had written quite a lot of music uh, for the, with the second uh, uh, um, librettist Michael West, who's a very established and very well regarded uh, 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 theatre writer in Ireland, um, and most of the team, in fact, were Irish. With uh, with and gradually there were more people who were not Irish getting involved in the project. For the, the first thing that I did with the project is I went to India. It was a mistake, obviously, <laughs> uh, in hindsight, but uh, I had never been to India before. I'd always wanted to go there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, over the, the subsequent uh, year or so, um, it was a, a gradual recognition that this uh, ultimately, which had started from an Irish perspective, uh, was, was, was a Canadian story, mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And one which is, of course, now also an Irish story, um, and probably more so an Irish story uh, um, uh, uh, and a Canadian story than even my need to go to India. In a way, mm. in some, to, 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 to many, in many ways, uh, it felt that, there, that this was the this was the real huge connection at that time. Um, but it, it was it was just that recognition that this difficulty of a linear through line um, and the difficulties that it, that it has. With, with regard to how things are placed next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, because in a linear through line where you've got a story, a hero or a heroine, mm -hmm. you have this issue whereby things take place linearly almost and you, you right. need to gradually develop work. And when I picked up Rene's book, it was, uh, it was an absolutely extraordinary experience. Simply because it had juxtaposition in a way that I had not yet experienced. Uh, this juxtaposition, the ability to place a very, very delicate, beautiful engagement with an, uh, an innocent figure and within one line erase that life or that figure. And that, ha that can happen in poetry mm -hmm. so, so astonishingly mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, and that was shocking to me. Um, shocking that this particular way of engaging with this particular story was so very effective and so non-linear and so uh, fragmented whilst being able to embrace the complexities without necessarily offering solutions or even pretending to. Right. Um, whereas with a linear through line with a large opera, you have this sort of sense that somehow you must have some catharsis, you must have some ending, you must have something that you can walk away from and feel you have now ticked a box, that you have somehow managed to go and uh, go to this opera or go to this theatre or film, and, and now, you, now you know, now you know the answer, or now you have some answer, which of course, the more I've dealt with the project, is, is, is something which is a fallacy. 
I, tonally speaking, I mean, when you listen to the two poems that were read this evening, the first one is almost like an explosion of fragmented words dangling, um, and then the other one is a, a far more epitaph. Uh, um, do you, like the variation in the different poems, did that inform the musical structure of what you were doing? Can you just explain that a little bit, please? Um, yes, well, absolutely. Okay. Um, and and uh, the, 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 the Rene's poetry translates into music very well. There is no difficulty in that. I never ex one of the things that I'm, that I'm always aware of when I'm writing either for film or writing with, in this kind of context uh, is that when it becomes difficult, when one becomes aware of trying to solve problems, so there's something, something perhaps not quite right at that point. And writing this work, very, very rarely, you know, not, not that there were no problems, but very, very rarely did I feel, how will I proceed? Answers came, yeah, uh, answers came quickly, and, and it was, yes, absolutely, and that word is in the right place, and it, it sort of, um, with my, my previous opera from 2003 uh, called Swage, I had a fantastic librettist then, and it was the same experience. It was the same, almost, you, you allow the words to really shape um, the, 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 the dramaturgical and the structural uh, context of the piece. Not to say, though, of course, this is, this is uh, a very substantial book of poetry, mm -hmm. and uh, this opera is one pathway through that, a pathway that I've chosen with a lot of discussion with René um, and with Tom Creed, the director, um, but it's one pathway. And so one translation or one, not even an interpretation as such, but maybe one transmutation of that pathway. Um, so yes, absolutely. Yeah. Owen, um, in regards to the creation of the whole, um, um, was that, I mean, you were in collaboration with Tom Creed, the director. Um, how did you know what components to bring to the table as it's not a formal opera? I mean, how did, what, what were the components you felt were necessary to create what you're doing? Well, the creative team was really the four of us, right. and we got together in uh, Ireland and uh, uh, in August of 2014, and then we kind of worked through the uh, formal structure and talked about how to do it, and that, and then Jurgen and Rene sort of went on from that, and that created a kind of roadmap of which uh, poems would be chosen. Right. It is kind of interesting that there are three singers in this, and, yeah. and then so Jurgen has written for our whole Turning Point Ensemble, and there are there are three singers, and and they they are um, not individual characters, and yet they do embody certain points of view. So there is a. Uh, soprano, and there is a countertenor, which is a very high male alto, and a baritone. And those, those are three very beautiful voices uh, together. And so uh, that's something that uh, Jurgen worked through, like which singers would sing where with uh, Rene. And I don't know, maybe you want to address that issue of how the poems come into different voices. Well, it's all been quite fascinating. Um, I think a lot of the decisions I would say that we made for Air India Redacted were through this series of conversations we had beginning in Ireland. And many, many thanks to Owen who introduced me to this amazing composer and, and to Tom Creed, our director. And so I just remember intensive discussions about history, about the narrative, as the narrative structure and techniques used in the book, just juxtaposition is one of them, the individual stories, balancing individual with you know, the bigger themes. Mm -hmm. And then I just remember a lot of back and forth uh, by phone and by email after that. And, and, and it was like an organic process how we decided, well, in budget to, you know, like that would not be six voices or eight voices, but, but these three voices. And then you kind of went away and, and went into that place where you had to create music mm -hmm. from all these ideas. I wondered if you could just add to that in terms of the voices. At some point, I had to let go, you know. And, and <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think as, as Owen has, has just said and as Rene has sort of pointed out, the, the, the actual genesis of the project to get to the point where Rene and I and Owen um, sort of had a discourse about, about making the work um, was, was, was long. And the final generation of this work that we're um, very happy to be presenting um, was compressed. 
Um, and I think what for me um, comes across, and I think it was, um, uh, sorry, the, um, Rahindra, is it Mahindra uh, talked about sort of the 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 delicacy that is required. Um, in in Milan uh, was was, uh, was R- Ramilan was talking about this 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 incredible um, sensitivity to how one goes about um, engaging with these and that and the, the degree of respect and and all of that sort of um, sensitivity. Mm-hmm. So what was really interesting for our engagement when we started first of all discussing this was that I think we quickly realised now no doubt. Rene had um, had a very very personal connection, and which which resulted ultimately in in, in first of all this this uh, um, extraordinary book book of uh, uh, children of Air India, but I think what was what was very clear, um, and I think this is a problem that that potentially I was very aware of for quite a long time was that what gives me the right as a composer from Ireland to to do this? Well, you know how how can I have the degree of ownership mm-hmm. over the subject matter? Um, how can I, and, and this is I think the other, the other lady talked also about this, this embodying um, for oneself the trauma. How, how can somebody from Ireland, although I'm Irish and my wife is actually uh, from, very, uh, from a, a place very close to where the Air India Memorial in Ahakista is. Um, so there's a certain sensitivity there in, in my family to, to that and uh, one could talk for quite a long time about the, the localised sensitivity of the people, particularly um, where that happened, uh, I think I think in a way that that plays a, plays an important role as well. But what gives me the right to do that? And so what we managed to achieve quite quickly was an understanding that actually, because I'd at that point already spent six years engaging with a project, mm-hmm. um, I, I, I you know which is a substantial amount of time for a composer. I actually gave up a huge amount of time of my career at, at, and had not taken on commissions for three years. Um, and I and I felt at a certain point that the trauma was my own, um, in, in the same way as was previously discussed by the panel. Um, and I can tell you, it's it's very difficult to write music when you're looking at a screen with tears in your eyes, um, which is which was often the case mm-hmm. uh, um, with with Rene's poetry. Trying to be able to to continue the engagement with a, with with the with with the music and when the logistics of of scoring, whilst literally trying to wipe away uh, and see, um, and, and so the choice of voices to go back to your to, mm-hmm. to your question, the choice of voices emerged very quickly from an understanding of the subject matter and the sensitivity to how best to place. Uh, um, characters or sort of embodiments of different aspects of Rene's poetry and that led to this particular choice. Obviously there are musical reasons behind choosing these yeah. three voices but, but ultimately the, the sensitivity to the, the, an, an understanding that I think both Rene and I, sh- I, I in particular shared uh, in, in terms of that ownership of the subject matter was quickly resolved. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so one interesting commonality I think we both had and I I mean, both of you could talk to this, was that it wasn't going to be a predominantly male or female. There had to be this balancing of both and then an undercutting of an indeterminate, almost androgynous, almost transgressive. And to me, that, that our beautiful countertenor kind of embodies that, that this undercutting. And it is very, very interesting to hear Kamal talk about, you know, the gender analysis of violence which is actually very prevalent in the Air India story. And it was through this panel tonight that I I really started rethinking about that. But I think um, one of the things I find quite fascinating is that Jürgen and Tom, who's not here yet, our director, they kind of get viscerally the underpinning aesthetically of my work. Um, Suresh is another person, blurb the back of my book, (laughs) when it was just a little book of experimental poetry, no awards won. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Indian Summer Festival, you know, brought me here and, and I read when this was just a manuscript. But I think there are people who get the work, you know, and what it's trying to do. Um, and, and, and you just sort of seem to enter into that. So this idea of the male and female and then something, something undercutting any type of settled polarity of traditional opera or a traditional narrative. Mm-hmm. 
uh, Jurgen just seemed to you just seemed to click into that. I think that was already there in your perspective. When I picked up the book, it was clear. It was clear. This is the book. It was, that was that's just said. This is it. This is this is and this is a, a the most uh, for for me at that up until that point in time was the most uh, exceptional response that I had ever encountered. Um, Possibly one of the most exceptional responses to the na this kind of uh, uh, um, complex, complex um, traumatic event, these deeply troubling com the complexities that that are actually engaged with in a, in a really simple and clear way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that the juxtapositions um, we talked about juxtapositions and and uh, um, you talked about confluence as being this important mm -hmm. term, this confluence, this idea of, of it's a it's a confluence of the opera in a way is a confluence of um, recognizing complexity um, whilst s simultaneously expressing, and I don't mean to to to, to demean the term by by using simplicity, but the simplicity mm -hmm. of the hurt, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the simplicity of that deeply felt hurt, um, that is, you know, it's that confluence. And it's in a way, I think what Rene achieved and what I've hoped to achieve is to create a work which does not demean the subject matter by being simplistic, um, but at the same time offers a place where perhaps that simplicity of emotion can reside. And that's that's a delicate balance which I which I which I encountered in Rene's book, and that was deeply inspiring. That that sort of that 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 clarity, um, yeah. In, in a previous conversation I had with Owen, um, I we were searching for the caption for what the work would ultimately be, and the term requiem came up, uh, but it's not a requiem, obviously, mm -hmm. for the m many choices that you've made. But from your perspective, what would you want to achieve from this kind of work in terms of it as a legacy piece? What, what is, in your view, your objective artistic ambition mm -hmm. in this? Mm -hmm. Well, it's such an honoring question. And for me, it boils down to one word, and it's witness. I feel that what we are doing here tonight, what Jürgen has spent years on, uh, what Owen has so generously and thoughtfully and patiently, very patient man, uh, brought together is an act of witness. So for an Irishman, uh, a, a great Canadian, <laughs> uh, all of you here, what, you know, who are we as Canadians, as human beings? People choose to use violence as an end uh, the state and states and government do so. We live in a world filled with such terrible things happening all the time. And I think as a poet, I never want to be the offerer of those simplistic bromides. Everything happens for a reason. To me, it's just one of the most terrible things anyone could ever say. It smooths out just the terribleness of life. And at the same time, you know, as the great Irish poet, said, you know, I can't go on, I must go on, that you, that you embody that, that dichotomy all the time. So it becomes an act of witness. What else? What else can we do? If people put bombs on a plane, everybody dies, and we the living, what are we left with? And so the beauty of Naveen's curation tonight with confluence, I love that it's not about an equation. And then confluence allows all of us. I also wanted to express my sincere solidarity to the poignancy of Jürgen saying that one of the first things you had to um, confront was your feeling of, oh, how can I take on this story? Believe me, I feel that all the time about this. So it's incredibly moving for me to hear you say that and I want to absolutely support artists' rights to tell, transgress. We understand it's an act of transgression and we do it anyway. And thank you very much. As, um, by the way, to further uh, support uh, that view of witness, one of the musicians in the Turning Point Ensemble characterized his playing 
uh, such that it, he felt detached, that he was very much a witness to what he was playing. Yet he was completely committed to it, but he says it was the most strange disposition he'd ever been put in. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, uh, a, a musician will commit deeply to a work and play it actively. Here it was the, the music somehow or other forced you into a surrendering of this witness disposition. So credit to you and credit to you in that regard. Uh, one last thing before I turn it over for questions, the audience, uh, there's a, um, as this is an interdisciplinary work, there's a visual component to it. Can you just um, tell us how that has been derived, how that's been created by John Galvin? Yes, yeah. well, I mean, when we did meet last August, one of the things when we talked about it was that uh, we wanted to have projections uh, as, as a major element in the piece. So we talked about various uh, people, and uh, Jurgen was uh, uh, brought forward John Galvin, and he's actually working, I think, solidly the last three months, creating a whole visual layer in moving pictures that will soon be revealed. Fantastic. Us. And, Fantastic. And, uh, you know, uh, in terms of what Tom is doing, uh, it's going to be a very simple direction. There's going to be one sort of long table that can be projected on with chairs and so on. Again, that will be revealed soon. So, so, <laughs> it, so but it will be memorized, the same, yeah. which is very yeah. hard score, yeah. actually, to memorize. So, so in that sense, it will be like an opera because you'll have three singers uh, in, costume. Moving in costume in the space with projection with uh, an ensemble of 16 players and, and it's going to be a very rich cumulative uh, experience of about 85 minutes without intermission. Fantastic. Um, I just add to that in terms of John Galvin, okay. the, 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 the visual artist, yeah. uh, his, his work is um, he's, a, he's a visual artist rather than a video artist as such, although he works with the medium of moving image. Um, but his, his real focus has been on the nature of the photograph. Um, and we have this relationship to uh, in, into the moving image as being right. sort of alive. When you see somebody moving on screen, there's a sort of a, a strange lifeness that, that happens. Um, and he plays with the, the, similarly, the death that is there in the photograph. Um, and that this still image, as is classic sort of film uh, and, and photog photographic sort of theory, but the, 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 the um, Andre Bazin talks about sort of this idea of the of the photograph embodying somehow um, the past, whereas the moving image is, is the living, and he plays with that. Um, that, that junction between the moving image and the still image in a beautiful way and, and, and I've uh, I mean, I'm honoured to, to work with him uh, on this occasion and uh, yes, that's just give, giving an insight into his particular qualities, I guess, yeah. Fantastic. Turn it over to the audience. Anyone have a question or questions? Um, not a question really, but a comment to say how Beautiful it is to hear what you're describing now, because when I was when I first read Rene's work, it struck me that sometimes poetry gets you at the cerebral level. Sometimes it is the way it slips off the tongue, and poetry meant to be heard. And then there's also images it creates. And somehow I think in this work you've really drawn all three together and, and been very complex about the way you've done it. And so congratulations just for for just the amount of thought and care you've put into it. So that's really all I have to say. I would like to add um, that after every performance, there will be a discourse session. So um, the audiences will be invited to share with the artists their perspectives on that particular performance. Every performance is unique. So um, uh, it'll be great to hear the response of the audience. And uh, certainly, this is a great meditation. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much for your comments before. I'm really looking forward to the production. Uh, I, I am wondering, though, if something that went through your mind putting it together that uh, through your art, you're to some extent softening the horror that, that you're sort of undermining, so softening, softening, softening the, the horror of the, uh, of the disaster, yeah. that, that uh, somehow the event will come out as a work of art rather than uh, as a work of, as something of history. Well, absolutely. Um, it's interesting that, that um, people talked about history earlier on. Um, and sort of the nature of what it means to commemorate, which I'm in no way 
claiming or wishing, in fact, that this is in any way a part of that structure of, of, of the way that human beings um, place events and history into particular frames. Um, the nature of the history of art has, of course, invariably engaged in acts of what you've just described, of, t of taking historical events and framing them in a particular way. And the nature of that mode of operation, whether it's the 17th or the 18th century, or if you move post into the 20th century and you look, of course, at sort of um, a new way of, of, of creating work, so which, which in a way frames different historical events. So, um, you know, in operatic terms, you've got classic examples like Death of Klinghoffer, Picasso's Il Il Guernica. Um, it, 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 it ultimately happens. We are humans, and we, and we do have a tendency in, the, you know, in, in, in all our history to wish, in a way, to understand something and, or to commemorate something and to, to paint it or to write an opera about it. Does it soften the blow? Well, does it help future generations perhaps understand the blow? Does it provide an interpretation or does it provide a, a means through which maybe an understanding can be arrived at which may not be arrived at unless we continue to, to find means of engagement. And the way that culture engages in, in both sort of historical documentation and aesthetic documentation uh, is, is ultimately, there are two very different ways of working, but they, but they occur, they happen. Um, I, I'm not sure it softens the blow. I'm not sure it softens the blow. I think I think it res it can soften the blow. I think we're trying to respect respect the horror, in a way. Um, and we're sort of engage with it, right? We, yeah. we say we're not interpreting the horror. Yeah, and we're it, not it, making it easy to, for audiences to to, to interpret it. Yeah. Um, far from it. Um, we're, we're offering. We're not offering that. But I see what you mean by the aesthetic object. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's such an important question. Uh, I had to struggle and do struggle with that. Uh, again, for me, it's about transgression and it's about undercutting. It's about juxtaposition. It's about materiality. All these somewhat abstract neo postmodernist words so that it doesn't just become a direct representation. I think when something becomes smoothed out, direct representation, uh, and, and Naveen and our wonderful panel, I think, alluded to this. You know, when we take away the multiplicity of story and just make it one nice, settled, traditional, straight-on narrative, then there's nothing wrong with that, and those can be some of our greatest works of art. But then art can veer too close to exactly that, where it becomes relatable and consumable. And so Adorno telling us that after the Holocaust, all poetry is obscene, I think is the challenge, you know. As a poet, I felt that challenge and I decided to do it anyway. And for, for me, Air India Redacted is, is a question. It's a series of questions asking the audience to witness. So there's nothing settled and saying, well, this, this is now the story of Air India, you know. There, who, what is that story? What is it? And so the constantly to question, you know. Please. Uh, I just want to ask, because Owen mentioned the reaction to and the commemoration of, of uh, Air India 182 and what happened in Ireland. And I guess my question, if I was going to put it really simply, is what is it about the Irish? Because in a sense, uh, this event is much more commemorated, mm -hmm. much more popularly understood amongst people, whether you're in Cork or Skibbereen or even in Dublin, but in that region of Ireland in particular, than it is here in Canada, great respect. Is, it, is there something in Irish history or something? I mean, the Lockerbie uh, murders, the uh, Lockerbie uh, airplane killings happened a few years later. I don't think there is the same response to that uh, in the United Kingdom, say, even though in some ways the events are in parallel, as there is the compassion and interest as there is, uh, as there is in Ireland. Is there something you can speak to about that? Okay, about well, what it is about, Ir uh, about the Irish? What is it about the Irish? <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to put it? Well, okay. So, 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 I, I alluded to this earlier on. Um, there are a number of answers, and, and we talked about this actually earlier today. Um, 
it, the Irish are having an interesting relationship to the rest of the world and that they never attacked anybody and never conquered any, anybody and, and have only existed for, for 99 years and next year it's 100 years, yay. Um, the, the Irish um, are, you know, they, they, haven't, they have a certain degree of understanding um, which maybe comes from a particularly neutral place. Um, what's interesting with regard to where Air India when A2 came down is that it came down off the west coast of, um, of Ireland, of the south of Ireland, in a remarkable place, I have to say. I think there is something very special about the people there. Um, and there's something very, um, something very delicate and something very patient about that particular community in the west of Ireland, in, in, in the West Cork area. There's a patience to them in the way they see the world. They sort of remember a world before the media was there. They, they, they were, they've been relatively unaffected by, um, by the kind of um, uh, global sort of digital world. Um, it's a quieter world. And so I think even in 1985 when this happened, it was an absolutely extraordinary um, seismic event for the community there. Um, and there was an immediate response, response to it, which, as you know and have seen in, in, in the memorial itself, um, resulted in a, a deep willingness to, to find a place for the Canadian uh, and Indian communities who were affected. Um, and they did that not from a, um, a bureaucratic perspective, it was not a decision made on the council's behalf, but it was an individual, very, very small community which decided to find a way of enabling the commemoration to happen. But it really is something special about that particular part of the world as well, um, which, uh, you know, as I said, my wife um, is, is from that part of the world, and um, there is this incredible, del incredible delicacy which re remembers a time but almost where they could still hear, you know, even now you can still hear horses miles away coming down the road. Um, uh, it's kind of an incredible silence about that area. The Ahakist Memorial, and I've visited many times, I've seen the sun go up there on my own um, at, at, at four o'clock in the morning, and it's an incredible spot, and it has an incredible silence to it. Um, and when you go out even further to the actual place where you can see this, the, the, the ocean itself, where the flight uh, 182 came down, that is uh, one of the most extraordinary, beautiful um, and uh, um, angular places, Sheep's Head Peninsula. Um, so there's, there is something special about where this happened. And I was talking to, um, sorry, I've, I've forgotten your name again, I was talking earlier to, to you about this. Um, something which, which is a locus for those affected, which is kind of special. If anything special may, may, may be there, it is potentially this locus, which people who were um, affected by the, the two recent Malaysian, uh, Malaysia Airlines haven't had that opportunity. Even the one that came over the U Ukraine hasn't had a, a place whereby, you know, because it was a war, a, a war zone, it hasn't had a place whereby visit and identification can happen. It's been sort of cordoned off, and of course we don't know what happened to the first one. So in a way there's something special about that as well. Uh, I can tell you uh, briefly, you know, when we went to Cork and we went to the hospital there, which has been largely rebuilt since 1985, and we walked in and there's a, there's a huge mural there commemorating the bombing and there was a re single receptionist there and uh, we told her we were stumbling in and uh, wanting to maybe talk to somebody or to, to see some part of the hospital and she was all amazed and she took us to show a glass case where they had the book uh, which has, for well, it's I guess the, the Canadian Justice, or somebody made this book, but in it are photos of those that were killed. Every day, this lady would open up the case and turn the page, and uh, so and and then we went to meet the uh, Catholic priest, 
who started talking to us about the nuns who had sort of taught him, who had been there during that period, and how often they talked to him mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, then, of course, we went to Ahakistan without even talking to anybody. It is an incredible memorial. So I actually had no idea how alive this mm -hmm. was amongst so many people uh, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, you know, I have found I'm meeting people every day that have some connection to Air India. It's maybe more submerged, I mm -hmm. guess, or it's mm -hmm. a different kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. I'm meeting all kinds of people, mm -hmm. including defense lawyers mm -hmm. and all kind or people mm -hmm. that happen to go to school with somebody who died mm -hmm. on the flight. And it is remarkable um, also on, in this part of the world how many <coughs> ripples there are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but in Ireland, it's certainly something special. Uh, this question has to do with opera, or perhaps <laughs> I want to hear why opera, uh, or maybe to put it differently, what, is, what about opera makes this, the works find home there? Because I'm hearing this idea that it was easy to engage this, this collection, the poems, with, with music, and I'm also hearing you talk about, I'm, I'm hearing the November 6th and the way that images, uh, I'm just hearing this confluence of genres mm -hmm. that are coming together very, very productively, very difficult, or rather maybe it's making the difficult articulable. And so what is it about opera that you guys are finding a space to make the horror articulable in a way that we can live with uh, and not just turn away from. Uh, if you could. Well, we invariably deal with words when we talk about these events. Um, and although we've been very careful not to use the word opera. <laughs> they, they don't use the word opera, the rest of us use it. <laughs> <laughs> the genesis of the work, I mean, I was, approached, I was approached to make the work because I'm a composer who has created successful operatic scale and op operas in the past. And so, um, as you mentioned in, in, in my introduction, I, I also do a lot of work in film music, um, and I'm a performer, and I work with electronic music, and I work with... Actually, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm strangely unfocused <laughs> and, and have... You're multi-genre. And, and, multi and, 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 and work, thanks, yeah, multi-genre. I'm strangely unfocused in my willingness to, to engage in pop music and uh, extreme noise music. And, and so I, I, have, I have engaged in quite a lot of different approaches. And one of the things that I've always found wonderful has been opera. Um, but we, we, we use words and words are sometimes not adequate. So, the, when I talk about the, the ease with which I found René's work translates into opera, um, I mean that in the sense that the, um, the appropriateness of at least the way that she writes um, has, a, has, a, has, a, has, a, has an ability to move very directly into, into this, this other form. Um, and there is, a, there is a particular world that opera is. You know, there, are, there are very clear systems. There are systems of the music, the systems of performance, the way that singers sing. Um, they, they all have their their backgrounds, and they, they, they need to work in a certain way. So there is ultimately a particular framing that opera allows. But it's, as I said earlier on, it's a bit like film. It has a particular structure, and it works in that way. And my role as a composer, in a way, is to recognize existing structures and existing uh, um, methodologies by which uh, these things occur, but also recognize their limitations. Um, and so, so therefore, in, in what I've done on this occasion, as opposed to the previous um, um, uh, versions of this work, which I have redacted. <laughs> and we're talking about big scores. I, I showed Rene uh, when she was in Ireland last year, the very substantial scores, which were three years of music writing, which I literally just took up and went, no. 
And in many ways, the, and the answer to your que this gentleman's question, um, you know, about the aesthetic object, is really that this work is my and Rene's and Owen's and Tom's uh, answer to that process of recognizing the ultimate failure of um, of framing horror and making it easy. It's, a, it's in a way in a way that that actual act of taking one's work, years of work, and saying no that is inappropriate, is ultimately also an answer to the question of why opera? No, not opera, not like this. This is inappropriate. This is a simplification, and this does not in any way respect or honor the materials in question. So in a way, that then allows us to say, but perhaps this, you know, at least now we feel we have a perhaps, right? Um, and, and, and maybe, maybe that's not a perhaps that everyone will feel is, is, a, is, is a response. And maybe one of the reasons why that might be, um, be only a perhaps for some people is because also it is a genre and it is a particular way of writing music. Um, I don't have a particular way of, of, I don't have a particular artistic vision that I'm trying to imbue this work with as such. I've, uh, I've, in fact, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a real subservience to the requirements of the material and the subject matter in the writing. But nevertheless, it doesn't necessarily always offer an easy way in. Some of the music, I hope, is extremely beautiful, um, extremely emotional, and other times it's not. But that is only to honor the, yes, that is only to honor the complexity of the subject matter that we're dealing with here, to understand that it would be a disservice to this story, which is still alive, to make something simple and to make an opera which is somehow, again, that you can walk away from and say, oh yeah, that wasn't that great. We're not setting out to achieve that. We're setting out a perhaps, perhaps something in here gives you or somebody else some place in which some meditation on what has happened can occur. Mm -hmm. So that might be the answer to why opera. It's one way of doing it beyond words. Um, I'd like to wrap up by thanking you, Jürgen, Renee, and Owen very much for an engaged, fantastic Thank discourse. Thank you. Thank you.